Hello everybody, good afternoon and welcome to another Oxford Sparks live Q&A. If you're new here then welcome, it's great to have you join us and this is part of a whole series of live Q&As that we're doing as part of our Science at Home campaign. So again, if this is your first time then please do join us again next week and I'll be giving you details for next week's talk at the end of today. Um, if you don't subscribe to us, then I would encourage you to do that as well. That way you keep up to date with all of our latest videos and animations and events like this. And we're also on social media, so you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at Oxford Sparks, again to get all the latest on the science going on here at the University of Oxford. Today I'm very excited to be joined by Sir Walter Bodmer. Um, so Walter is currently head of the Cancer and Immunogenetics Laboratory here in Oxford at the Wetherill Institute of Molecular Medicine, but he hasn't always been in the field of oncology, in other words, the um, branch of medicine that studies cancer. In his own words, he has moved from mathematics and statistics to genetics, cell biology and eventually cancer research, so a very illustrious career. His certificate of election to the Royal Society says, Few scientists have contributed distinguished work in such a range of fields and involving such a range of experience and techniques, mathematical and experimental, and such a range of organisms. Sir Walter has won many awards, including the Michael Faraday Prize, and is also a former principal of Hartford College here in Oxford. So telling you this, I really don't know how we're going to even begin to scratch the surface um, of his research today, but I'm pretty sure we're in for a really interesting conversation and I'm delighted to be joined today by Sir Walter Bob So good afternoon. Good afternoon, it's a pleasure to be with you. Wonderful, so, thank you. During the time available. <laughs> Absolutely, we sure will. So um, we're, we'll chat over the next half an hour or so and I should also say that we are live so if you're joining us here today on this hot June afternoon um, then please do pop a comment on in the chat box if something that we're discussing um, sparks your interest then please do ask because that's the whole point of these being live and uh, yeah we'll put those questions to water and see if we can get them answered. So. Um, as I say, your career has spanned such a range of things. I wonder if we should just start by having um, a quick chat about what you're working on at the moment, what your current research group does um, in the immunogenetics and cancer laboratory. Well, our main study is on cancer and we study colorectal cancer, cancer of the bowel. And, and we do that by having cell lines that have been grown out from human cancers. Mm -hmm. We have more than 100 of them. So they provide us with the model that we can work with. Uh, and we have an interest in different ways of treating cancer using the body's own immune system. Mm. And I still have an interest in uh, the things that started me off into genetics, because as, uh, as people have heard, I started off as a mathematician. I yes. used to be able to do sums quite well at school. <laughs> I had no training in biology, whatever, when I was at school, a very distinguished school, Manchester Grammar School. And I didn't know what I was going to do when I got to Cambridge until I came across this extraordinary individual scientist, uh, Sir Arnold Fisher, R. A. Fisher. That's what took me into the quantitative and mathematical and statistical aspects of genetics. And that still remains a part of my major interest uh, through what we might discuss later, the genetics of population differences and mm -hmm. how one can study the genetics of characteristics that don't behave in a simple way uh, as you might want in families. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's really interesting to hear you talk about how you've brought all those different things together. Um, because when I was sort of reading about your research pathway, it, it did seem, despite these different fields, a very natural course of progression and you've been able to bring in these different um, things that you've looked at. So, um, yeah, uh, maybe it gives some hope to people who haven't been able to study exactly what they wanted at school that actually uh, you just said you you never studied biology per se but you've obviously gone on to the uh, to this path so um yeah maybe uh you could tell us a little bit about about um what got you into genetics in the first place as opposed to maths yes well it, it was very much that uh, fisher who's an extraordinary one of the great scientists of the 20th century and they made most of modern statistics in a way is based on, on his ideas, the way you randomize people for clinical trials, the ideas of uh, <clears throat> significance testing and estimation, all sorts of things. But he was also notable for the fact that um, he realized that you needed a quantitative theory 
of the way evolution works, taking into account Mendelian inheritance, what we now know as the basic uh, model for the way genetics works, uh, which had been put in opposition um, to Darwin's theories of evolution by natural selection. And he really um, made it possible to see how uh, evolution by natural selection not only could be explained by mechanisms and patents, but actually required them. And he provided the mathematical basis for that. So my entry was through following up on his interests in having models of how genes change in their frequency and population, and actually doing lab work, experimental work. He was very keen that you actually work with your own data. So he was interested in primroses. So my half my thesis is about primula uh, vulgaris, which is the common primrose, which has three different forms, so pins and thumbs, and then something called the homostyle, where you get the stigma uh, and the style at the same level so that they can self-fertilize them. I spent my time using computers, which was unusual in those times, to model what might happen. Why would you get uh, that homostyle, uh, and why were, were they all homostyle? Because you might thought that the, the self-fertilization was an advantage, but it turned out that it wasn't that simple. So that's what got me into the quantitative side of, of genetics. Um, later, the, the cancer thing was uh, was quite different. I mean, I was happily uh, doing my genetics as a professor in Oxford, having back, come back from nine years in the States. And <clears throat> all of a sudden I was asked, well, would you head this cancer institute, Imperial Cancer Research Fund, the precursor of what's now Cancer Research UK. And it sounded quite interesting. So in the end, I said yes, but I didn't really know much about cancer. So it was a steep learning curve because you can't go to a job like that without learning what it's about. I mean, even just the basic things, you know, what does a clinician do about cancer in the hospital? I used to go uh, with my colleagues who were heads of various uh, um, oncology departments, as they're called, especially at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, get them to take me down and show them what they did and what it was all about. So that's how I got into cancer, but quite a long time after I'd started, done a lot of the, these other things I'm involved in. Because what you read out when I was elected a fellow is quite a long time ago. So I have done a few things since then as well as what I'd done before. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's really interesting to hear you talk about that. So you, am I right in thinking you went to Imperial? Um, that was the first time you were invited to, to head up the cancer the laboratory. Imperial Cancer Research Fund. The ICRF was actually the first real cancer charity set up for research in cancer in the early part of the 20th century, before even the start of the Medical Research Council. And it was started by um, surgeons and, and physicians, but particularly from the College of Surgeons, because they thought it was time to have more of a targeted approach to how to find out what cancer was, what the incidence was, what determined it. And The UK was the centre of an empire, and that was thought to be a good name. And it became the ICRF, and then uh, with my successor, Paul Nurse, distinguished scientist and former president of the Royal Society, uh, they decided to fuse with the other major cancer charity, Cancer Research Company. So that's now Cancer Research UK, which is the major large-scale um, cancer research organisation. Absolutely, I'm sure lots of people are familiar with that name, even if they're not familiar with the former. Um, it was it was great to hear you talking a bit more about your early research with Fisher, and I just kept, picked up on a couple of things there. One was that, um, and I think in something uh, that you wrote, you put that people were actually quite surprised that you wanted to go and do your own data collection, um, that you actually wanted to do the manual work, so to speak, as opposed to just sitting and analysing data. So, um, I mean, we're really familiar with that now as researchers. Was that something at the time that wasn't so much a done thing? Well, uh, first of all, let's say Fisher himself, who had a mathematical background, actually did work, experimental work, not molecular biology, but he had a mouse colony. He was interested in certain breeding programs. He actually used to go and collect data on the proportions of different types of Primula in, in, in the woods in, in Somerset. So he was very keen on the idea that if you're going into analysis and understanding data in any particular system, you should actually know something about how those data were collected, 
uh, and what's behind it. Mm. Uh, but at the time that I went to work with Fisher, there were not many people with a mathematical background who did. I mean, he was an outstanding individual. And I think I was only one of one or two or three people who actually, during his time when he was professor in Cambridge, went to work with him. So uh, you can't say it was unusual. It was unusual for a mathematician to do yeah. that anyway. Uh, so it was necessarily also unusual to want to do some of the experimental work. And nowadays, with all this bioinformatics and everything that people talk about, I'm very keen that I don't think any bioinformatician shouldn't have been in a lab and learn how to get the data that they're going to analyze. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so unusual for a mathematician at that time. Um, and one of the other things that you just mentioned was that you were actually using the early computers um, mm -hmm. to do sort of what was to become statistical um, scientific modeling. Uh, what was it like to to be working on computers at that time? Well, it was, uh, it was quite interesting. I, I got involved in computers through a vacation job when I was a student. Oh, wow. I had a statistics course and I wanted to do some statistics in the summer. They wouldn't take me on because I wasn't trained enough. So I worked for a company called Avril, which used to be an aircraft company. And it was through that that I got to use computers first. In fact, I used their and they were simple calculations uh, that you could do, but it was a bit like magic because you could do so many of them. And that yeah. was one of the first commercial computers, the Ferranti Mark I Star, which was the Manchester University pioneering computer. Yeah. And then when I started my work in Cambridge, I, I realized that some of the modeling that I was doing, the equations that I was looking at, um, they were hard to solve analytically. You couldn't get simple solutions. But you could do things numerically. You could just work through them uh, numerically. You could introduce random variation into it. Um, so I was really one of the first to use computers for analyzing that type of model, especially in, in genetics. And it was quite fascinating. I was doing it at, in Cambridge on the EdSec computer, which is the one that was being used uh, by um, the people, Max Perutz and John Kendu, who eventually got the Nobel Prize for working out the structure of proteins. And I'd stand in line there late at night, putting in my, uh, my paper tapes and things, um, running these programs. I mean, it was quite primitive. You didn't have um, anything like, like the computer languages you have now. When I first programmed, it was just uh, what's called machine language. Mm -hmm. It was a, a, a terrific advantage to have had that opportunity just by chance in a, in a summer uh, yeah. job to then apply it to what I was interested in. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I bet you could tell sort of even then that that was probably where the future lied in, uh, in analysis. Yes, you, you, you could, but there was no way one could have predicted the way it's gone. I mean, I spent, uh, I eventually went west. I went to uh, Stanford where I worked with another outstanding biologist Joshua Lederberg who discovered sex in bacteria for which he'd got the Nobel Prize. Yes. And um, he was very keen on developing computing and in the not as primitive as it had been but, but and he developed tremendous resources and very interesting in, in, in how they could be used. And when I came back to Oxford it was totally primitive. They had people there who hardly knew what a computer was like and that was in 1970. Wow. And, yes. and I went Nine years later, to the ICRF, they had one funny little desktop computer, and that was all. So uh, I was very involved in that through my late wife. She worked with me and had her own group. We, we developed the computing resources there in a way that was quite unusual even at that time in, in the late 1970s. Yeah. It's absolutely fundamental. And when you see how it's changed in that time, it's just unbelievable. You see more about how it's changed if you've been involved at an early time. Yeah, I bet. I was going to say, though, it's just amazing to think that just those few decades ago, um, what it was like and how much has changed. And I can't even imagine now trying to research uh, when we're so used just to being able to, I mean, even aside from the actual data analysis, but just being able to go and find a scientific paper. Oh, yeah. um, everything's at the touch of your fingertips now. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's incredible to think. Um, have you ever seen the original portable phones, they were like bricks. Yes. Um, you know, I don't know about decades, I mean, even in the last 10 years. Yeah. So much of what we're so now so used to has, has been developed. It's quite extraordinary. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've just got my eye on the time and yes. uh, and it's flying away with us. So I was just wondering if we could talk a little bit about the Human Genome Project, um, because that's obviously something that you were very much involved with. And I think is something that our viewers will be interested in hearing some more about. So um, maybe for our younger viewers and people who don't know much about it, could you tell us what that project was and why it was so important? Yes, um, the Human Project was the initial suggestion that one should get a complete DNA sequence, a complete sequence of all the coding that made up the information that makes us human, all the, all the genetic information. And um, it was being discussed first around the early to mid 80s, when, and I was one of them, I guess, people began to realize, well, maybe it really would be possible to get the whole sequence. And that there would be a huge advantage to having that because you would then have a catalog of all the genetic information that existed, not the variation that comes later, but you'd have a catalog of all the different genes and what they might do. And, and the many ways in which you could use that. You could use genetics to uh, follow uh, an inherited trait in a family where you didn't know what the real cause was but you could follow it and eventually by what was called positional cloning, you could find out where the gene was and what was the defect in that gene that gave rise to that disease. So there was a, a, a huge impetus in my view and, and, a, and a tremendous value that could come from doing the Human Genome Project. But there were lots of people who objected. They said, oh, it's, it's, it's big data, big, you know, you've heard about big data. They said it's big science and going to take money away from all that we're doing and so on. And they were completely and utterly wrong because actually what it did is quite the opposite. It made the opportunity not only to sequence the human genome, but all sorts of other genomes including smaller ones, obviously, the bacteria, E. coli, which Lederberg first used for the genetics of, of bacteria, which is now absolutely fundamental in, in any of the sort of molecular model genetic engineering. So it, it, was a, it was an exciting possibility, and I got quite involved in promoting it with well-known people. Many people may have heard of Sidney Brenner, who was one of the great people in the early days of molecular biology, an extraordinary individual who sadly died quite recently, and, and uh, with a few others, we, we promoted it. I was involved in some of the uh, very early discussions, chaired a meeting at the NIH when the things were being discussed and how you'd go about doing it. So it became a major project. Um, it was very fortunate that at the time, it was being suggested um, towards the end of the 1980s, the Wellcome Trust in this country certainly came to have a lot of money because they invested it uh, in a very wise way. Uh, um, Roger Gibbs, after whom one of the Welcome Building is, is named, realized that they should invest their money and not just uh, own the company. And that made a big difference because that provided money that the government wasn't really prepared, prepared to provide to take a major part in the genome project. But it's been yeah. just a huge development. And of course, when you think it took years, I mean, maybe five, ten or something years to get the first sequence. And now you get a few sequences of humans, you know, almost every yes. day. Uh, it's an extraordinary development. Another example, and of course, very much driven by what you can do electronically. Also, of course, at the, the chemistry of it. But it's a, a lot of it is driven by the uh, electronics that enables you to do those things. So there's nothing nowadays really that you can do, whether you're in ecology, if you're studying the penguins in Antarctica, you'd surely be interested in how they vary genetically. You can get a little thing, take it with you, take a blood sample and almost do the sequencing on the spot there. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, so it, there's no area of modern biology where you can't say there's an impact of, of understanding what the sequencing has, gives you, what, what, what you can find out through that. Yeah, really transformative to so many fields. Um, we've had uh, a few questions in just uh, while you were speaking, uh, which are, uh, a couple of them are, are linked um, to that. So one question from Martin is, in the Human Genome Project, project, what does it mean to map the human genome? Because everybody has slight differences in their DNA. So how does this work? Do you take an average? Um, well, the, 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 <coughs> the genome is arranged into chromosomes colored bodies, the things you see under a microscope when a, when a cell divides. So, and it's, it's a long strand. I mean, and, and the total number of, of bases, the individual letters is, is three billion, three times 10 to the ninth. Uh, 
So there's a defined, um, more or less, background sequence and organization for all that information. Um, and most of us will have mostly the same sequence of that. There's slight variations. And actually knowing where something is in that chromosome, it's like being able to look up uh, a dictionary and find out where the word that you want to know something about is, 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 very, is very important. Um, and so the variation is the fact that um, while we carry the same basic genetic information, uh, there's enormous variation between people. That's the natural variation in the population. Which, you know, when I started in genetics, people didn't realize that there was anything like that amount of variability. Because you could study it first in proteins, and then at the DNA level, you know, about every thousand bases out of the uh, thousand million, you know, that you, you get in the genome as a whole, although not all of it is informative, one in a thousand on average you and I will differ by. And it's some of those differences have an impact on uh, disease susceptibility. Of course, sometimes things go wrong and the sequence is wrong and it doesn't make the product that it should. So that's when you get diseases uh, like uh, <coughs> sickle cell disease, which is an abnormality in, in hemoglobin, so you get cystic fibrosis, uh, which happens when both copies, you get one copy of a gene from your mother, one from your father, if both are wrong, then you don't have a functioning gene, and in many cases that's what can cause a disease. So um, studying, mapping the genome is there. Of course, if you get a new organism that you're studying, then you find a new sequence and you look how does it relate to other organisms that come, uh, that are evolutionarily related. Uh, and, and mapping a given variation means if you find a family, say, in which you've got uh, a disease segregating, that means you've got uh, parents who might have had the disease, you've got children who have it, and you follow the pattern of inheritance, you want to, if you know where that gene is that's causing that, then you can find it out. That's, that's what positional cloning so-called is. And you do that by using genetic markers, by using these differences between people that may not have any functional meaning, but you know where they are. And if you know where they are, and you see that one of those goes with the inheritance in the family of, say, a, a cancer susceptibility, then you know that somewhere near that must be the gene that's gone wrong. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, that's one of the aspects of mapping. There are many other ways in which you can find out about whether um, gene variations have something to do with the disease. I mean, one of the areas I've been involved in a lot, my, my laboratory is called immunogenetics, is if you do a transplantation between people, we differ in ways that lead to rejection, of the as you probably know. If you yeah, yeah. want to do a bone marrow graph from one person to another, you've got to match them up. Um, uh, most of that difference is to do with a complex genetic system that I was involved in, uh, in, in trying to discover initially in very crude techniques and a bit of statistics. Um, but some of that variation is, is very important for disease. So there's some diseases, for instance, ankylosing spondylitis, and only people who have a particular, otherwise quite normal variant version of a particular gene in that system. They uh, the only ones who really get that disease, ankylosing spondylitis. Well, there are examples of, of um, <coughs> allergy, extreme allergies. In fact, I've got one. I, I once took allopurinol, which helps you if you've got gout. And uh, when I took it again, I was terribly sick. And I have a particular HLA type uh, that, that, is, that leads to that adverse reaction. And it can be very important because if you don't know that, sometimes you can die from those adverse here. So that's just an example of the ways you can use this sort of information usefully. Yeah, enormous, enormous medical applications. And um, I suppose it does sort of start to lead into some of the questions of should everybody get their genome mapped and be told, you know, what they're susceptible to and... Um, yeah, it leads on to all sorts of different interesting questions, but uh, yeah, it's, it's really great to hear you explain all of that. Um, while, while we're on the subject, um, Natasha asks, what's the technique that's used to sequence bases? Um, well, it's, it the, many the, the techniques have, have changed over the years. They're, yeah. they're electronically quite sophisticated. Um, basically, you can copy DNA if you want to say what it is, and, the, and that was goes back to another 
famous scientist who was at Stanford when I was there, Arthur Kornberg, you can copy DNA so that with enzymes. So if you give the basic constituents, the nucleotides, you can copy it. Yeah. And there are ways of seeing what happens when you copy a piece of DNA. Which, which are the letters that are added in sequence? And so you can take bits of the DNA and find out what, what's the sequence in that bit of DNA by what's being added as you, as you synthesize it, so to speak. And they're a very sophisticated uh, Oxford Nanopore, which is a, a very innovative company based in Oxford, came out of Oxford University, where you can pass a DNA strand, and it's got its sequence of bases, through a pore, pore made of, of proteins. And as it passes through, the different bases give a different electronic signal. And you can pick that up and you can get the sequence out of that. So the technologies are quite extraordinary. And I mean, when I was first involved in this, you did some sequencing in your own lab. You really wouldn't do it anymore now. You just send it off to someone who's got all the equipment. Yeah. For it. Which is strange because it means that what you do in a lab has changed a lot over the years that I've been involved. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think as well, I'm just going to say in case we have any younger viewers watching who aren't familiar um, about the bases, you can explain it a lot better than me, but there's four nucleotide bases, A, T, C and G, and they form the whole of the genetic code. Um, so I do encourage you. Um, it's such an interesting subject to, to go and, and read up some more. Um, but I, I just thought I'd put that in case anyone was wondering what we meant. Oh, we yeah. talking- well, it's, it's like having the letters of an alphabet. It's a four letter okay. alphabet. And it's, it's the particular sequence in a particular part of the genome, particular part of a chromosome, yeah. that will determine what sort of a protein you make. And the proteins are the things that, you know, do things in the body or provide structures. Um, and, and so knowing the sequence can tell you already quite a lot about mm-hmm. what it's doing. Yeah. Indeed. And Natasha says, thank you very much for your answer. Um, so thank you for that. Um, time is still ticking away. So um, just to go to to a a slightly different question, um, if you don't mind. Amy says, hi, thank you, this is really informative. Just wondering if you've done any research on epigenetic treatments for cancer. Now then, that gets me into cancer. So why don't I say something (laughs) about cancer, cancer first. Cancer is a disease of cells in the body when they're not doing what they normally should do. And it arises because there are changes in in the body there changes what's called the somatic tissue which are the cells of the body that make your different tissues but not the ones that you pass on through egosperm to your offspring Uh, and actually what is it's when you get a sort of rogue genetic change that allows the particular cell that carries it to sort of free itself from the constraints of the way it's normally growing and so it's actually the accumulation of a series of those changes which are thought of Primarily is to, in terms of mutations, they're altering the function of the proteins and enabling the cell to, to grow eventually without limit. And in fact, uh, we were talking about Darwin, I think, maybe before. I mean, it's an evolutionary process, but within the body. Now, uh, one, one of the things one has to realize, we all start from one single cell that has all the genetic information, basically, that enables us to be who we are. Uh, but... Different tissues use it in different ways. So the blood, you know, if you've got cells that make hemoglobin, which is the thing that's there in the blood, they've got to have that, but you don't get hemoglobin being made in your skin. You've got a different... So there are lots of different types of cells within the skin, within the bodily tissues of one sort or another. And they each have to make different combinations of these genes. That's how, from only 20,000 or so genes, you can get a huge variety of combinations of things working. And the way that that uh, is organized is by what I think is the main epigenetic change. So it it means that you've got an epigenetic change is really a change that happens because the DNA itself is modified, but not the sequence. So there are bits of the sequence that are modified chemically by what's called methylation. And that plays a major role in telling whether actually the bit of sequence that it's controlling is actually making the protein or not. So that sort of a change is very important. Now, what what happens in cancer is instead of a mutation, you can get changes in that nature of the control, and that's what's called an epigenetic change. And it's not been studied, in my view, nearly as much as it should be. I think there are probably 
more to be found out now from trying to find out which genes are controlled in that way. And we have, of course, we have examples. That's the sort of thing I work on in, in my lab with the cell lines that we work. We, we look for differences between the cell lines, like differences between the cancers. Uh, we look to see if we can find differences that are something to do with the way the cancer grows. We say, well, is that because of a mutation in the gene? Or could it be because of one of these methylation changes that changes the, the function of the gene? And, and that's an important study. Um, and it, it, but there's a lot of also loose talk about epigenetic changes, which I think we won't get into, but where people think it matters more in ways that I think not so clearly understood. Yeah, we shan't get into that now then, Wing, uh, coming towards the end of our conversation. But yeah, it sounds like there's lots of important avenues to pursue in, in the epigenetics um, field. So thank you very much for, for asking that question, Amy. Um, as I said, we're sort of coming towards the end of our Q&A. So if you have any final questions, then please do send those in. Um, otherwise, um, I suppose something that I wanted to ask that we, we ask um, most of our, our guests on here is, what tips you would have for young people looking to get into science? I know it's a very broad question, but uh, anything you particularly think is useful for, for your children? I think or the first thing is, to, is to learn about science and to be excited by it. Whatever aspect of science, you might like the natural biology, you might like the way that chemistry works, you might like something about how the universe is put together. But it's a wonderful, exciting field, and it's not often thought in the way that it's actually a part of our culture just as much as Shakespeare or anything else or listening to a Wagner opera. It's a part of our culture. And it's very important to have that and to learn enough so that you can see how exciting it is. That's the starting point. You must be excited by what it can tell you. And then in the end, I think it's very important to, you know, gradually find your way in. What aspects of it do you find most interesting and exciting? And um, not everybody, of course, who's excited in science ends up being a research scientist the way I've been, which I think is a, is a wonderful opportunity. I mean, the idea you can discover things and maybe also be helpful in, uh, you know, treating diseases, stopping climate change, you know what it is. It's all going to be dependent on science. But there are ways, of course, of using a scientific background that isn't necessarily discovering new science. Everything we do has some scientific basis to it. Teaching people about science is very important. Uh, understanding how the applications of science can determine what happens in a, a virus pandemic, for example. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's, I think it's a wonderful area to get involved in. But only do it if you're excited by it, if you really enjoy it. No point in doing things you don't enjoy. Yes, yeah, exactly. Same thing goes for everything, I think. And uh, yeah, thank you. That's, that's really nice to hear. Um, is there anything else that you would like to, to add before we go? I know you're a big advocate for sharing your science with the public, which is fantastic and goes without saying is something close to my heart as well. So, um, yeah. I, 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 I would say that that's to the people who are scientists who want to become them. I think a part of your obligation should always be to explain the science you're doing to people who are not specialists in it. Public engagement, public understanding of science. And I think that's very important. It doesn't have to be necessarily what you do all the time, anything. But I think all people involved in science should play some role in explaining what they're doing. Because it's the scientists who have the expert knowledge in an area. You can't expect everyone else to have that. And uh, the scientist has to learn how to explain. And I think everything in a way can be explained if you don't use technical words that people don't know what they mean. Uh, and I think it's very important. It's not only important that people understand aspects of the science, but also that they can learn to enjoy it, which I think is, is, is important. I mean, you can watch interesting scientific programs on the, uh, uh, now on all sorts of things, YouTube, and I used to say that the radio and television, but people hardly use that anymore. Or you can go to the Royal Institution, you can go to museums. There are many ways to enjoy science. And I, but I think it's very, very important that scientists play a role in that in explaining what they're doing. They should explain what they're doing. The government should listen to what they have to say, but the policy in the end is not necessarily the one that's determined by the scientists. They can determine uh, and suggest what should be the policies, but ultimately pol policy decisions are a different matter. And actually, I think that's very important so that scientific advice is not contaminated by policy issues. If you 
bias the advice by what you think ought to be done, and you may be wrong. Uh, that doesn't help. You've got to tell the truth and the whole truth, and as far as you know it. Yeah, an important distinction, and I think um, I would definitely agree with everything you said there. It's uh, it's really important for, well, in my opinion, for for people to explore science, and it's such a incredibly broad thing that even if you're not interested in you know one aspect of molecular biology even though you should be um you might be really interested in space missions or volcanoes and um yeah it's 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 really exciting to um explore these things and uh even if scientists themselves can't communicate it then uh, that's what people like us are for so uh yeah i would strongly encourage people if they're interested in sharing then um, to come to us and uh strip out all the jargon as you were saying because it's yeah. it's easy to get the messages across in one way or another um fantastic well it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you um unless there was anything else you wanted to add i think that we can probably let you go and enjoy the sunshine this evening um but cool. just to remind people yeah. that uh, yeah it's pretty warm today uh, just to remind people that we have another one of these q a's next week we're taking a turn away from medicine to computer science and we're um very pleased to be joined by Maike Svart on tuesday uh, which will be the 30th of june at 3 p.m and she's going to be talking to us about turning algebra upside down which sounds very intriguing um i know that she's uh, got some interesting stuff to share on her programming research that she's been doing and she'll be joining us from Switzerland um, so it'll be great please do join us for that and as I said do follow us on Facebook Instagram and Twitter or subscribe to us here on YouTube and you'll be reminded about that as well um, so thanks very much for joining us all your questions uh, stay safe and we will see you again soon so thanks Walter and uh, bye from us bye